sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. But Boys Life originally started with um, Keith Duffy had an idea of doing uh, an autobiographical show because he wanted to write a book. But Keith tells the most amazing stories, but they being on a bit of paper would do no justice. He needs to stand there and do it. And he, you know, he'll take the smallest story and he can turn it into a movie. So he had this idea of doing a one man show where he told stories about his life, about being in Boy Zone and Carnation Street, all these things. Um, and he kept to see me do um, one of my solo shows in Dublin. And after the show, we sat down and had a couple of drinks and he told me his idea and kind of, as we kind of discussed, we were like, you know, wouldn't it be great to do this together? Because we could actually compare stories, talk to each other. So that's what Boys Life originally was. It was just the two of us going on tour, basically, to, to do an autobiographical show, telling stories. And then we sang a couple of the Boys Own songs and a couple of the West Life songs to kind of accompany some of the stories. Um, and that was, you know, we put that tour on sale and it sold out in like four hours. So we thought, OK, maybe we'll put another one on. So we put a second tour on that sold out. Um, and then we decided, you know, something that we were only going to do for a few weeks, we decided, well, why don't we go out and actually sing more of the songs? Because the fans were enjoying the stories, but we were getting a lot of tweets and stuff like that from fans saying, oh, we didn't get to hear this song, that song. So then we went out and did a tour of us just doing all the songs from Boys Own and Westlife. And that, you know, lasted for a couple of years. And then that kind of grew and grew and grew uh, right up to us actually doing a full blown tour um, with live bands, the big screens, the back and vocalists, the fireworks, all of that stuff. Um, and and to up to where we are now, which is us actually writing and recording original brand new Boys Life music. So what started as an idea in a pub has, uh, has turned into probably what's going to be the rest of our life. <laughs> yeah, and it's such an amazing story. It's so cool. And also, it's, it's almost like, you know, having been through it all already, having gone all the way from just starting out to being massive superstars, you've kind of done it again because you really built this up from not like a grassroots level because obviously you were very well known. But from my understanding, when you first were, um, were singing as Boys Life, you were, you were singing to like backing tracks and it was, it, it was, you know, not low key exactly, but it was more low key than it is now with this huge like shebang. Oh, it was, it was definitely low key. The first tour that we did when we were doing the autobiographical show, we were singing to Filipino karaoke backing tracks. <laughs> They weren't even our original backing tracks that we had from the band. We just found them online and said, we're only doing three songs or, or whatever it is. We might as well just use these. Um, you know, and then obviously when we decided to do a proper tour then, then we obviously got the proper tracks and got them done properly. And now, as I said, we're, we're working with a live band. But yeah, it pretty much did start as, it was like starting again, you know? And I think that's why we're taking so much pleasure out of going out on tour again. Like this is our, I think this is our fourth tour now we're doing. Um, and they just keep getting bigger and bigger. And, and yeah, it's, we're kind of proud of it. You know, we're proud of what we were able to achieve. A lot of people thought this was something that was a bit of a gimmick when we started out, but we've kind of proved now with the album and the tour that there's a little bit more to this than just a gimmick of two guys from two old bands. Absolutely not. And all uh, people or a large majority of people in the music business who like to play live from bands who had hits and a lot of hits, I think it was it 21... UK like smash hit singles that you've got between number ones. Yeah, I think it's something like twenty one number, number one ones. singles. Yeah, unbelievable. Oh, if, we, if, we're going, if we're talking about top tens, it's probably closer to about forty or fifty. I would say. Yeah, because I thought twenty one quite quite um, small number. You know, that's that's just between Westlife, Boy Zone, and my solo career. That's that's just number ones. It's a bit twenty one. Wow. So so I mean, bearing that in mind, you'd have thought 
there would be um, members of of those bands wanting to go out on the road. And this is like such a great way of doing it because you get mm. hits from from both of you. When you were when you were first doing those, you know, the first Boys Life tour after you did the autobiographical stories. Um, what type of venues were you playing? Because now you're playing, you know, huge theatres all around the UK. But how did it start? It's, well, it started in, um, in actually in massive conference rooms in the Hilton hotels, you know, ranging from 900 people to, you know, the one in Birmingham was like 2,000 people. So it started in, in kind of in hotels, but then it went to kind of big clubs, um, which, which didn't work for us because it was all standing... And if you come to our show, you know, you need a seat. You need to sit down and enjoy the show. Our, sh our show is over two hours long. Um, and a lot of our fans now, they're not young anymore. We've got some young fans. We've got some fans the same age as us, but we've also got fans that are older than us. And they don't really want to be standing in a mosh pit, you know, at a Brixton Academy, <laughs> you know, for two hours listening to ballads. So <laughs> I think for, for us, we were getting the balance wrong on where we were playing. But now we've, I think we've just got it perfect. We're playing... You know, like playing Liverpool, Philharmonic Hall, Bridgewater Hall, Manchester, places like that. That they're big, old, beautiful theaters that people are coming. And they're, they're coming to see a show. You know, it's not it's not a rock concert. It's not a you know, as I said, it's not a mosh pit. People are actually coming and sitting down, and it, and it makes it easier for us as well because we can perform the songs. But because it's a theater, we can also talk to the people, and we can we can make it more of a show than just a concert. Yeah, yeah. And there's not pressure on you to choose only upbeat tracks because obviously some of the most beautiful tunes are those slower songs and the ballads. And obviously in a nightclub, people yeah. don't respond. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of weird because we, we do a lot of festival touring, in, in, especially in the summer, all across Europe. And, and actually, we did a lot this, this year in the UK. Um, and we do have different set lists for different places. You know, like, for example... We, we do a festival in Denmark every year and we're, we're like the only kind of pop group on it. Everybody else is like two Unlimited and Scooter and all these massive dance bands. Then we go on at about eight o'clock in the evening when everybody's wrecked from dancing. And then we just do this whole set of kind of sing-along ballads and it just chills the whole place down. You've got like 30, 40,000 people all going mad all day and then they just chill out and they get their lighters out and their hands in the air and they sing along with the ballads. So... That's something we've been doing for the last few years and we love that. But then there's other ones that we're headlining and we have to keep the energy up. So we've got to kind of dig out as many of the up tempos as we can. And if it's not an up tempo, then it's got to be a ballad that everybody sings the words back, like like words um, or swear it again or fly with our wings. These songs that are kind of anthems for people and they, and they, they sing them for us. I mean, that is the brilliant thing about those songs they do have that anthemic quality which means that people are going to be just you know yelling those words out even if they well it makes it easier for us because when we're doing five nights back to back and we lose our voice we just gotta go you sing <laughs> <laughs> and it always works how how do you take care of your voices and how how is that has that changed at all since those early days because it's grueling um, work singing these yeah. songs which are hard it's, to sing as well it's gonna sound weird but like we, we look at how many shows we have back to back and that kind of determines how much we drink and kind of how our lifestyle is. Like if we've got two shows, we'll drink a lot more and we might go out after the gig and have a party and whatever. But if we've got five shows in a row, we'll have a really strict routine where we'd come off stage and it's straight home and into bed because we've got to try and, you know, keep our voices alive for, for four more shows. So it really depends. You know, we, 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 We'll go out and enjoy ourselves if we've got one show, but we'll take care of ourselves if we've got a string of shows back to back. Oh, that, that makes absolute sense. And then, I mean, you've mentioned that kind of camaraderie or alluded to it a couple of times. Um, so you're actually, you know, both really good friends from what I understand, like you, you holiday together. And I mean, is that is that normal in the, in the industry? I mean, that must be so nice to tour with like a really good mate. Well, I think for most people, you know, especially from the boy band and the pop world, they're kind of put together and you become friends because you're like when you go to school or you go to university or, or you get a job, you meet people and you, you, you become friends because you're piled together. The beauty for Keith and I is that we were friends and then we decided to do this together. So we were friends before we even started this, which makes it so much easier. You know, we didn't have to get to know each other. 
because that is kind of an awkward thing when you join a band, you know, that, that first few years trying to get to know the people around you, what makes them tick, you know, how to keep a kind of a happy balance going. Keith and I know each other inside out. We don't have any of that. We know not, you know, we know what buttons not to push for each other to crack up. And we know how to help the other person to get through if they're having a bad day or a good day or whatever. So we know each other inside out, which makes our life so much easier. Yeah, it, it, it really must. And obviously you've got a new album out uh, called Old School. What was the... What was the thinking behind making new music? Because obviously it's a risky move, and and, and you've really you've really pulled it off. Um, and it, is is this going to be like a one off, or is the thinking that you're going to now, you know, this is your new project, and as you said, the rest of your life. So is this going to be the first of many releases? Well, we've already started writing the next original album, um, so it's definitely not a one off. Um, to be honest with you, there was no risk for us because the way we looked at it is, if if people like the album, great, we carry on touring and we put the new songs into the set. If people think it's rubbish and they don't like it, it doesn't really matter because we've got 21 number one singles in our set and they're still going to come and hear them. So we didn't really have any pressure. We kind of had, you know, it was almost like it having a mulligan. It doesn't really matter what happens. You get it was, a, it was a free pass at making an album. You know, we weren't under any pressure. A lot of people make albums and if the album doesn't work, maybe they're not going to be able to sell tickets and not tour, but there were two separate entities for us because people are coming to our show because of our back catalogue. So we got the freedom to to try something new, and we're delighted that people have liked it. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, you can tell from the title of the record. I mean, is that you know referencing the fact that you are of the old school in the sense of having those melodies and the you, you know dip traits that are probably slightly different to uh, to what you hear often on top forty radio, or is or was old school? No, hundred percent. The, the the name of the album, old school, is because of the music. We, we we deliberately set out to write an album that would sound like it was from the 80s and 90s. We wanted to make an album that would be something that Keith and I would have loved growing up, that sound. Um, the template for the production and for especially for the kind of chorus melodies and stuff was that any song on this album could have been in a, in a, a movie soundtrack for a, a big 80s or 90s movie like the Karate Kid or Top Gun or, you know, one of those three men and a little lady, you know, all those big 90s, and 80s, and 90s blockbuster Hollywood movies. And they've always got that big soundtrack. And that's what we wanted. We wanted an album of songs that sounded like they come from the 80s and 90s and, and would have been on a movie. Well, I think I think you pulled it off and it's refreshing to hear this type of music. Uh, and it's always been the melodies that, are, that have really grabbed me and I know a lot of other bands. And you talk there about music that you grew up with in the 80s and 90s. Um, what, yeah. what were your favorite artists? What, what, who were the people who made you want to become um, a singer? Well, Michael Jackson was, you know, he was the biggest thing in the world when I was a kid. So, you know, he, to me, he was everything when I was growing up. You know, all I loved every one of his songs. I, I used to wear my dad's golf glove to think it was Michael Jackson. And I used to walk around the house grabbing my crotch and flicking my leg like everyone else did. <laughs> um, and then as I got a little bit older, I started to find my own music. Um, I, I got into the Beach Boys very early. I know everybody else around me was uh, into the Beatles, but I was always a Beach Boys fan. You know, Brian Wilson's my favorite songwriter of all time. So I was a huge Beach Boys fan. But then obviously when I was a teenager, then I got into... You know, what was pop culture back then, bands like Oasis and Guns N' Roses, Nirvana, Blur, Metallica, Pearl Jam, Green Day, all these bands that were kind of, they were the pop bands basically back in the 90s. And I was all over all of that, loved it. But uh, my underlying love was always for the Beach Boys. Yeah, well, you can you can see that they were a huge influence. And for those people who don't, know the story obviously it's it's very difficult to condense it into into a short um interview but how did you know how did you get your break in the music industry if, if you were to describe it in in that way because i know there are a lot of young people uh listening uh, to this podcast who are aspiring musicians and creatives so it's always useful to you know what it, it's it's really hard because people always ask me this and, and people go like oh my daughter or my son's a great singer and you know, what do you do? Back when I started, there was nothing you could do. I was I was just in another band and the audition to get into Westlife came along. Louis Walsh advertised it in the paper and, and I went for the audition and it was just literally like winning the lottery. It was a one in a million chance. It didn't really matter how talented you were or what you could do. 
it was all luck, you know, you just had to be in the right place at the right time. Obviously, the world changed a little bit then, you know, coming into the, the 2000s when you had shows like Pop Stars and Pop Idol and X Factor and all these. So they were outlets for people with talent and Britain's Got Talent. But like right now is probably the easiest time in the world to be discovered if you've got talents because of social media, you know, because at the end of the day, if, if, if you put up a video of yourself singing uh, a song you've written or playing an instrument or whatever, and you're good, it'll go viral. People will see it. Um, and that's kind of how music always was. You know, if, if somebody heard a good album, they tell their friend about it, then they bought it, then they tell their friend. So there's a much wider and bigger platform now and, and a fairer balanced platform for young people to be discovered. Um, Back in my day, you just had to be lucky. Now, you know, you can you can just keep plugging away. And if you're good enough, the cream will eventually rise to the top. Yeah, I think that's a very good way of looking at it because I think a lot of people do get very, um, you know, they find social media quite an intimidating notion. And obviously there's all types of conversation um, around it. How do you find kind of adjusting from that era? Because obviously there would have been all sorts of pressures on you when you rose to fame. But now... Yeah. Uh, alongside all the traditional promo, like like these type of interviews, you've got to be thinking about social media and all that type of stuff. Are you a fan? I, I don't think about social media at all. I, I, I put up pictures of me playing golf or of my babies or my daughters. <laughs> That's it. Um, I, I'm just glad social media wasn't around when we were at our height because I think that probably would have, would have cracked us off, you know, because it was already intrusive enough with just having paparazzi and the red top media chasing after you, trying to get stories and stuff. But to have the whole world basically being a paparazzi now, because everybody's walking around with a camera phone in their hand, um, I think I probably would have lost my mind. So I'm glad we missed that wave. And I feel sorry for artists and, and, and movie stars and footballers now that they've got zero privacy, that it's gone. You know, that anyone, that anyone that wants to do anything in the public eye, your privacy is completely gone now. Um, and we thought we had it bad, but well, the people now, the likes of Niall Horan and Harry Styles, Ed Sheeran, Adele. I, I just, my heart bleeds for them. I don't know how they, they get on with it because, like, I know from Niall Horan, Niall Horan can't take a piss without somebody putting up on Twitter and telling the whole world, you know? So I'm just glad we missed all of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it really is different. And I guess, is it diff does it change the way that people do their live shows now? Is it, are live shows even more pristine than they were? because of the fact that people have camera phones in the audiences. Like, yeah. make a tiny little slip up. Like, it's just going to Yeah, go that's off. the thing. You, you, you're, you're, you're a lot more... Actually, the nerves are a little bit more now when you do a show, and you have to be... You've got to be so much more focused. Because as you said, you can make one little slip up, and then somebody takes that 10-second snippet, puts it online, and then that could ruin everything because people think that's how shit your show is. They just see this 10 seconds, and they go, like, oh, they sang it. With you. We actually had it. We had somebody put up a video a couple of years ago that we were just having a, a bad moment. We hit a couple of wrong notes in a, in a 10 second video and it just looked like we were the worst thing, you know, that ever happened to the stage. When actually, you know, when I look back, I was like, it was, I could just hear just, the, 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 you know, the chord came in and someone just hit the wrong note and it clashed and that was it. These things happen. But when that's all that somebody sees, they don't see it, you know, in the context of a two hour show, it can make people think you're rubbish. You know, and, and I, you know, it's happened in the past. We've seen, we've seen it happen to Christina Aguilera before, you know, Twitter and all that stuff. There was a YouTube video of her singing out of tune on some award show and it went everywhere. It was, I think it was one of the first viral videos to go around and she's one of the best singers in the world. Mm. So there is that extra pressure on now that it's not just the people in the room. Um, and I think it's not even the singing anymore that, that, or the music that you have to worry about. It's what you say in between the songs. Like, because we used to be, quite crude and we'd have some funny jokes and we might, you know, we, we'd, we'd have some banter and interaction with the audience, but even now you can't do that because you're bound to offend somebody, you know, that's not even there. They'll see a video of you saying something to somebody who finds it funny, but they won't find it funny at home. And all of a sudden there's a, a whole rigmarole about it. So you just have to, every, every time you stand on the stage and there's people in front of you now, you have to just imagine that the whole world could possibly see whatever you're going to do next. Yeah, I mean, it is no... It's just kind of shit, though. Because <laughs> we, we just kind of like to 
feel like that when we're in the room with the people that it's just us in the room and what state what goes on the room stays in the room you know but that's not yeah. the way it is anymore yeah uh, and you could i guess you could tailor shows in the past more to who's actually in the room rather than correct to, to the entire world if we, if we did an over 18s gig we'd use bad language and, you know we'd be a little bit more ourselves and a bit freer but if we're at a family show and those kids it's going to be two different kinds of shows but the problem is now that they video what we do on the over 18 shows and that stuff gets shown on Instagram and Twitter and then the kids get to see it anyway so it's kind of it makes it kind of difficult yeah yeah it, it, it is a, a real minefield and as you say those big stars you you talked talked about a few names there um in, you, you've talked about your inspirations but in terms of modern people at the moment really in the limelight do you have any favorite pop stars of, of the current day um, you know what? It's, it's been quite. A, there's a, a, the, the few I named there are fantastic. Like Ed Sheeran's obviously incredible. Adele's incredible. Lewis Capaldi is probably my favourite singer to come out in the last fifteen years. Um, and obviously, you got to look at the two boys from One Direction, Harry and um, and Niall. They've done phenomenal work. You know, um, coming out of a band like One Direction and to be able to to kind of veer so far left of and right, left and right of what they were doing and and come out. Smelling of roses is, is quite a, a credit to them. Um, but besides that, there hasn't really been anything else. I'm still listening to all old music, you know. Besides those, they've, they've all had a couple of songs I've loved, but I don't have an, any new artists that I'm going to can't wait for their album to come out. Maybe Lewis Capaldi. But yeah. everybody else, is, there hasn't been a band since, oh, I can't even remember, maybe since Snow Patrol that I actually was excited about the next album. Yeah, well, bands have um, seemed to have really stopped now. It's too expensive. That's the problem. It's too expensive for bands to do it. Everybody wants to make albums in their bedroom now, and you can't. Everybody's got their little home kit. They can make the whole album with themselves. And, you know, most, most players now end up just being session players for these bands when they go out. So there's very few bands because it's so expensive to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I hope if you're, so. if, you're start, if you're starting out, if you're starting out and you've got no money and no record deal, it's virtually impossible. You ain't going to get five guys together that are going to have the, the time to give up from work to go write songs together, go to the studio, give it up. That, that was okay in the 80s and the 90s, but you can't do that now. Yeah. You know, the world is the world is too hard to do that now. And that's I think that is why we're seeing a shortage of bands. You know, maybe you might get some college bands, people that you know did it like Snow Patrol and Coldplay, that they actually played together in university. You you might find bands like that. But the idea of someone like you two happening again, where you just got four working class boys that pitched up and started making music, that's not gonna happen again. Yeah, I, I suspect that you're right. So it's uh, all the more important to get out there and see. It's right now. It's right for now. But look, everything changes. The world works in funny ways, you know. Music keeps turning around, you know. Like if you look now, everybody's using 80 sounds in their production. It's It's gone just like that. All of a sudden, everything sounds synthesized again in the 80s where we went through a whole period in 2000 where everything had to be kind of raw and rocky. And, yeah, and the 90s was all dance music or else it was either you know, Oasis and Blur and all of that, or else it was just pure d dance and pop music. And everything just seems to go around in circles. And, and who knows what, like maybe it's going to be all, you know, maybe Jamiroquai will come back next year and give us a proper 70s album or something like that. You know what I mean? Like a BG sounding record. And then everyone will be using that sound. Like even Coldplay or, you know, their new record, and Harry Styles, they're all using that, that real simple 80s synth sound in all their songs. And so yeah. let's see what's next. Maybe 70s. I'd, I'd love something like the 50s to come back, that whole that unplug cool. where instead of you got, instead of an electric bass, you've got a big double bass and, you know, just little three-piece bands like Elvis, Johnny Cash, like people like that, how they started. That would be amazing if that came back again. I really hope something like that does. Um, although I am enjoying the, uh, the 80s stuff. and uh, Sil Yeah, I me too. Sonic I am now. enjoying the 80s stuff. I, I really do. I've always loved that, you know, that sound. The Prince was always great with that synth sound and, and it's nice to hear it on the radio again, even if it is in a modern way. I still love to hear it. Yeah, yeah, me too. And the Silk Sonic album as well. I don't know if you've heard that, but uh, Bruno. No, I haven't. Back. I reckon you'd really like it. It's Bruno. I'll have to check it out. Back. And uh, it's called Silk Sonic. And that is very, very 70s, super melodic. Definitely got to check that out. I think you'd really enjoy that. But I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you and having you on the podcast. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks I'm a million, Tom. For your tour. And I would encourage all the listeners to check out your new album, the new Boys Life album, Old School. So thanks very much for taking the time. Pleasure, buddy.